So let's get started. Welcome to the last day here, last uh, day, last uh, session. I hope you are still all um, f fresh in your spirit to uh, do a little tour de force. We are a little bit behind, so I might have to speed up a little bit um, today. So we started talking about uh, modeling of uh, turbulent combustion yesterday, and we introduced a um, few models, simple models, and we also introduced some statistical concepts, um, uh, such like the cumulative distribution function, the probability, des uh, probability density function, joint probability density function, and also the conditional uh, statistics. And so uh, now we want to look at first uh, here two different models for premixed combustion. The first one, uh, maybe just because it's such a nice, elegant model that shows you, you know, what you can do um, with, with uh, you know, in terms of modeling approaches with the tools that we have already developed. And then the level set method is a, a model that's very often used, uh, you know, available in commercial codes, uh, in, in RANS and LES. And it also has its um, limitations, but, uh, but, but it's a very useful model. And then we'll talk about uh, non premix combustion for uh, just a little bit. And, and then after that, we have uh, two more topics, one on machine learning, one on hydrogen, which um, especially the one on hydrogen um, is, is meant to maybe also show you a little bit what's, why hydro, hydrogen from a combustion science point of view is so interesting, uh, but also complicated, um, but also uh, just to show you you know, how we use all these tools that we um, have developed or discussed so far. So the bremos libby model is a model for pre-mixed turbulent combustion. It's a model really for what we called earlier the corrugated flamelet regime, where the flame is basically infinitely thin. And what we do then is we introduce a, uh, a reaction progress variable, um, which could be based on the temperature, it could be based on the product mass fraction, but it's defined to go between uh, roughly zero and one, okay? So, so that's kind of obvious from this. You see easily that I can uh, derive an, a transport equation for this because I have a transport equation for temperature. Tu and also Tb minus Tu are just constants. I can just multiply these into the equation and then I get an equation for a quantity like this. So that equation, then again, we can um, apply the an averaging, here the Favre averaging, to that equation. Then I get two terms which are unclosed. Once one was the subgrid, uh, one was the, sorry, the, uh, the turbulent scalar flux, and so the turbulent transport, and the other one, uh, the chemical source term. And now, you know, the first thing we have done so far always is to say, well, we have the, uh, the scalar flux here, the turbulent transport, and we use a gradient transport assumption for that, right? And what, what we will show now is that introducing this modeling assumption, we can, in a way, rigorously show that that assumption is wrong, okay? And, and we'll come up with a different model for this. And so that's the, that's the main part here. And then we'll also talk about how to close this term uh, within this framework. So we want to assume the flame is, uh, the chemistry is fast, uh, the flame is infinitely thin, so that the uh, Kolmogorov scale is much, much larger even than the uh, flame thickness. And then, um, f I mean, fuel, all the fuel conversion happens in a very, very thin zone, and so if I would do a measurement, let's say I have a turbulent flame here, I would do a measurement, I will always see either burnt or unburnt gas because the, f the flame zone is so thin. I, would, I you know, have very small probability of finding a state that is in the flame zone. And so from that then, so intermediate states are very unlikely, and from that we can formulate um, a model for the PDF of the progress variable. The, the probability density function of the progress variable, we can just say uh, it must then be a double delta function. I used that yesterday already as an example for a double delta function. So we would say um, there's, there's a certain probability uh, for any given experiment I do 
there is um, a certain probability of finding unburned or of finding burned. And um, these two, I don't know what the probability is, but that's my unknown parameter that characterizes then, you know, the different states um, in combustion. So we write the PDF as, as this composite uh, of two uh, delta functions. At, at burned and unburned, um, not sure if I really said this yesterday the way I should have said it, but the delta function is defined uh, so that the delta of zero goes to infinity, and for, for all other values that are not equal to zero, uh, the delta function is zero. What I, what I did say was that the integral needs to be uh, equal to one. Or here, the integral of this one here is equal to alpha. The, in, the integral of this one here is equal to one minus alpha, and then both together uh, have an area of one. So this mean delta of c means if c is equal to zero, then that, you know, that's the position of the delta function. Or if c is equal to one, that's the position of the other delta function. And then, um, so that's what we said. Alpha plus beta must be equal to one. And here's the definition again of the delta function, right? So uh, all in German, so, but because I explained it to you in, in English, now you have learned some German words. Okay, there is another uh, interesting property of the delta function we we're not going to discuss, but uh, it's, it's very useful uh, for, for working with delta functions. Okay, so, so this is how this looks like then. Let's say we have a, a turbulent flame. You know, it has a mean flame front position here, and then, you, you know, it, this is one instantaneous realization, but then I could do a measurement and measure C. So here's unburned, here's burnt, and I could measure C, uh, you know, maybe 5,000 times here in this location, this location, and so on. And then I will find that, you know, if I'm far ahead of the flame, the probability of finding burn is zero, so everything will just be unburned. And then if I get closer to the flame, I find, have a higher probability of finding burned and some unburned. And then exactly at the frame front position, probability of finding burned and unburned are equal. And then if I'm far behind the flame, then, then the probability of finding burned gas is higher and so on. Okay, so, so that's what this is. And so now we fully described the PDF, except there's one unknown parameter, which is you know, the strength of, of each one of these. And, uh, you know, that's this parameter alpha, which I don't know. But, um, um, it, you know, that, that then I would have to determine. So now we have the PDF, um, or let's say we have the PDF of C. But um, what we're interested in is this correlation, U prime, uh, C prime, tilde. And that correlation depends now on the velocity and the, or the joint statistics of velocity and progress variable. And um, so, but, but uh, if, let's just say for a second, if I know the joint statistics of, so this is the joint PDF of velocity and progress variable, then I, if I have this, then I can just determine this mean function, you know, by plugging this in here as the function Q, right? And so this is, so then this is nothing else than Q, here is nothing else than uh, U minus U mean times C minus C mean, right? And then the mean of all of this. So, okay, so let's first worry about this here. This now is a joint PDF, and I can write it as we're using Bayes' theorem. So the joint PDF of this is the, the PDF of U for given value of C times the PDF of C, okay? So that's what Bayes' theorem tells us. And so now the question is, what is the conditional PDF of C? Um, you know, it turns out you, you get certain velocity fluctuations in the unburned at C equal to zero, and you get certain velocity fluctuations in, uh, you know, in the burnt gas uh, at C equal to one. And, but there's a big jump in between these two. So the main variation of the velocity really comes from the jump in the flame front and, and less you know, from the turbulence. But still, I can say, OK, I have a conditional PDF at C equal to 0, and I have a conditional PDF at C equal to 1. 
And if that's the case, then I can just plug in here the PDF of C, which we had defined here on the, on the previous page. This is the PDF of C. I can plug this in here, and then the joint PDF is just here this delta function at C times this conditional plus the delta function at C equal to 1, and then again times this conditional PDF. So then I can plug this in here, and um, you know, I, here this is the correlation I'm interested in. That's what I mentioned, you know, this is just depends on U and C. And then the, um, this here, this mean is then just given by this. I have now an expression for this PDF I showed you on the previous slide. And it turns out you can analytically now um, determine a, um, a model here for this. I mean, just, you know, X this out. And it comes out to this, where these, this is the conditional uh, mean velocity in the burnt and the conditional mean velocity in the unburnt. Okay? So this is the model. So we said earlier, uh, usually we use um, a gradient transport model for this, but now we found something else. Is this good or is it bad? Is the gradient transport model uh, uh, worse or better? Um, the point here is that this model had, uh, we made only one assumption for this model to derive this analytically, and that was that the flame is infinitely thin. That was the only assumption that we really made. Okay? So, under that assumption, then, uh, we can see how good the gradient transport model is. So, let's look at a, a, an example like this. I have a stationary flame here, with turbulent, and then, so there's a flow from the left. And, and from left to right. And then, of course, if the flame sits here, there's an acceleration of the, of the flow across the flame. Okay? And then, um, so this means UB is larger than U unburned. Okay? So this, this difference, velocity difference, larger than zero. This was the model we just had. C is between zero and one. And so C times one minus C is also between zero and one. So definitely always you know, positive or, or zero. And this is always larger than um, zero. And so this whole thing here is larger than zero, right? And then if we look at the, um, at the gradient transport model, we see that um, usually you would expect from a gradient transport, the value of C is high here. It's low here. You would expect the diffusive flux goes from large values to small values, right? That's what the gradient transport model tells you. Um, but here, we have the gradient of C is positive. Okay, so this is positive. And then DT is always positive. We have a negative sign. So the gradient transport model would say the flux is negative. It, it goes from large values to small values. But this here says exactly the opposite, okay? So uh, the gradient transport model in this case is wrong. And we find something here that's called, that we call counter gradient diffusion. The, the apparent diffusion uh, goes, goes you know, from small to large values. And really the reason for this, this is something we observe. I mean, you observe this also experimentally. This is something we observe for premixed turbulent flames in the corrugated flame regime, meaning the, the flame is very thin or the, the um, uh, in other words, the turbulence intensity is not all that high, okay? So turbulence intensity is not all that high, meaning you don't get any mixing inside the flame and so on. So then the, the acceleration, it acts, you know, it acts like a transport process. It takes the, the acceleration over the flame front, you know, it takes stuff and moves it very quickly from here to there. And that is, is like an apparent transport process and uh, that's reflected then here in this model. So if we um, model turbulent flames, or if we uh, wa want to model turbulent flames, uh, using a transport equation of a progress variable, then we need to worry about this. because So this means uh, this term here for um, small turbulence intensity in the corrugated flame regime, uh, it goes this way. And when you have strong turbulence in the thin reaction zones regime, it goes the other way. The, the, the gradient transport model uh, would be okay, again, for, for a much stronger turbulence. So 
that's, a, that's something one has to uh, worry about, and people have developed models that, uh, that try to, uh, you know, blend from the, the transport model from one regime to the other. But one, I, I think one thing that is uh, important that comes out here again is that a model is, you know, a model has to consider the regime. A model has to consider the flame structure. It has to look at the micro state, you know, that that you that physic that you physically have. You have to take a, a lens, a magnifying glass, look at the microstructure, look at how the, look, does the flame look at the microstructure, how is the interaction with the turbulence, and then the model has to reflect this. So that's, that's one thing that uh, comes out here. Now, that was the transport term, then we can also look at the chemical source term, and the chemical source term here then is just modeled by saying the um, uh, the, the mass of fuel that is burned per unit volume and time is just uh, the flame surface times the burning velocity, you know, times the density, that's it. Uh, per unit volume means it must be the, the surface, the flame surface area per unit um, volume also. And so this is, uh, this is what the sigma here is, that's the flame surface density or the flame surface area per unit volume. And um, so that, you know, is, can be modeled here with algebraic models. Uh, you know, it's just one example. And, and it can be modeled also with a transport equation. People have come up with a transport equation for this. Now, I'll show you that on the next slide. And then the burning velocity here, we say, uh, you know, you have the unstretched laminar burning velocity, but that can be modified by stretch also. We saw this, you know, curvature or strain can make the flame faster or slower. And so because of this, we introduce here this so-called stretch factor. The stretch factor is just the ratio of the local observed burning velocity to the unstretched value, okay? So if it's one, you know, it just burns like, a, like an undisturbed flat, undisturbed flat flame. Uh, faster, than, larger than one, it burns a little faster. Slower than one, it burns a little slower, right? So that's, that's what this I not factor is, and we, I, you know, I, I mentioned this twice because we come back to this uh, later on when we talk about hydrogen also. So if you have locally the, the structure of an undisturbed laminar flame, an undisturbed flat flame, this I not should be one, and I not not equal to one means, you know, you have some effects of a stretch or, you know, modifications in the flame structure or something like this. Okay, one thing that's interesting here, and maybe I'll just write this down and then I'll come back to it, is I could say uh, here omega, this omega C is equal to uh, rho U times SL0. That's just, you know, what you, what you get from um, uh, an unstretched laminar flame. And then this, uh, no, sorry. I made a mistake. So um, here I could say this is SL. I, I put these together and then uh, equal to, uh, and then times sigma. And I could call this here, uh, let's just call this A, you know. I just give this uh, SL times sigma, I give this a different name, okay. I, I, I introduce a new variable that is SL times sigma. Uh, that's important here when we look at this equation. This is an equation for the flame surface density people have come up with. You see it looks very similar to the, um, uh, let's say, the epsilon equation in the k-epsilon model, also the k-equation. We always have here a convection term, we have a turbulent transport term, we have a production term, and we have a dissipation term. Okay, that's, you know, very typical. And very often, uh, models like this, they are just written in an empirical way, you know, so that, um, that the uh, units here are correct and um, um, the units are correct and you just have a turbulent transport, production and dissipation, okay? Um, now what's interesting is the question, does this now depend on the burning velocity? Yes, this thing here, I mean, omega C depends on the burning velocity, right? Uh, and also here in this equation, I have the burning velocity. But now we do a little trick. 
uh, assume for a second the I naught factor is equal to one, okay, then the burning velocity is a constant, right? If burning velocity is a constant, then I can multiply the whole equation by the burning velocity and move it also inside the differential. And then here in the first, in the first um, term, it just says SL times sigma. I call this A, right? Here also is A. Here's A, here's A, and here's A squared, right? I mean, here's an SL times SL, so it's SL squared, uh, sigma squared, it's A squared. Which means I can solve this equation for A without knowing what the burning velocity is, right? And then I can plug the A in here and get the source term without knowing what the burning velocity is, right? So, so the point is, uh, this equation is independent of chemistry, right? I mean, it is really the limit of infinitely fast chemistry, and it does not distinguish between, this does not distinguish between a rich flame or a lean flame. It, it just doesn't appear. The equivalence ratio doesn't appear. Okay, that's just to keep in mind. And then, so that's the Braymore's Libby model. And again, I think the main reason for showing this is the surface, flame surface density models. They are used um, here and there. And, and the other one is, I, I find the um, derivation of this counter gradient diffusion, I find this very elegant. And, and so the second model we want to discuss here for previous combustion is the level set model. And we discussed this. Um, Already, we introduced this equation, the level set equation here already. We say, uh, this was how it was defined. We say we have a, let's say we have a flame here, and then here's unburned, here's burnt. And we said we just define a scalar, which uh, is defined such that it is zero at the flame front. And in the, in the unburned, it is negative, and in the burned, it's positive. That's it. Okay, and then from that, I can uh, derive an equation like this, and it has the burning velocity here, and, and what's interesting is that this equation now, um, it's valid uh, with the way, the way we derived it, it's valid only at the flame front, okay? So the rest of the field is not really defined very well, and we need to come up with a definition. Somehow we need to define the value of, of G away from the flame surface. And what we do very often is, um, also maybe I, I should say, uh, this year, so interesting here is this has no diffusion term. The diffusion is somehow in this propagation term. So the character of the, uh, of the equation is different from our normal transport equations. And, you know, the, and that's also um, a reason why, why it's valid only at the flame front. And it's valid here for thin flames. We assumed, we, we derived this here also for kind of an infinitely thin flame front. So it's valid in the corrugated flame regime. Okay, so here's what I wanted to say. It is valid only at the flame front. And typically what we do is we define the, the field as a distance function. So each point here, the value of G is nothing else than the closest distance here to the surface. Okay, so... Um, that, and we uh, can define it by this. So this is the dif this definition. The gradient of, of G is equal to 1. Then it will always be a distance to the flame surface. Now, what's interesting is if I solve the equation, we said the equation is valid for the flame front. So if I solve this for one time step, the flame front will move a little bit. And it will tell me exactly where the flame is you know, after this um, uh, time. But it will, there's no property in the equation that conserves this distance function, okay? It will move every point also a little bit further. Uh, in fact, you know, I mean, this point here doesn't even have a flame speed. There's a flame speed here. This point doesn't have the flame speed, it's only here. But, but you, you, you extend the flame speed into the burn and into the unburn, you move this, but it does not conserve the distance function, okay? So, Typically, what you have to do, you have to reinitialize um, uh, the field after, let's say, after each time step, or maybe after a few time steps, so that this is conserved. Okay? So, so there are numerical methods to do this. Uh, the level set methods, they are used in, in many different fields also. 
Uh, they are, uh, really, they come from computer graphics and uh, where they are used a lot. And uh, so the, you know, the, the numerical techniques, they, they exist. So, so this is called then the reinitialization step. We need to solve this, and then we need to reinitialize the remaining field. Now, the burning velocity here, it you know, could be the unstretched laminar burning velocity. But we can also you know, replace this by a burning velocity here that considers the effect of stretch here by curvature and strain. And then we get an equation here that looks like this, has all of these effects included. Okay, So that we can solve. We know how to do this numerically. And it will always tell us where the flame front is. And then, because we said, um, you know, in an instantaneous sense, in a DNS kind of sense, um, you know where the flame is, it's infinitely thin, and then ahead of the flame, you have unburned condition, uh, behind the flame, you have equilibrium conditions. That's it, right? Okay, but um, so the issue now is that works well for the, for the corrugated flame regime, but not for the thin reaction zones regime, because, because for the thin reaction zones regime, the, the the flame's not infinitely thin. You have mixing in the preheat region, you know, and you get a, a, a broad, fl uh, broader flame uh, thickness. And so this formalism somehow is not valid. So, uh, you know, can we have a formulation that's also valid in the thin reaction zones regime? And um, yes, you know, um, uh, Norbert Peters has come up uh, with a way to formulate this also. And it's interesting because considering now the physics of the thin reaction zones regime, we'll see that new terms will come up which were not in the original equation. And so if you, um, if you look at the flame structure, we had defined this earlier. We said there's a preheat region which is chemically inert, and then there is a, a very thin um, uh, reaction zone, inner reaction zone, and then, <laughs> again, here's in German, uh, I've looked over these slides so many times. I don't even see that, you know, that uh, it's in German or not. Um, funny. But um, anyways, uh, and then there's an oxidation region. And what we do here is now we want to say, instead of tracking the whole, I mean, assuming flame is infinitely thin, we know in this regime the reaction zone is infinitely thin. The, the flame is, is broad, but the reaction zone is still very thin. So now we want to say with the G equation, we track just the position of the reaction zone. And then we need to see you know, what we do around it. So G equal to zero now at the end of the day will track the uh, position here of the inner layer temperature. So we start out then here with, um, uh, with the a temperature equation, and we want to write um, an equation for the dynamics, for the evolution of an isosurface of the temperature. And that, you know, I mean, that's also a mathematical formalism. Um, uh, we can say again here, this is the same thing we did earlier. We said, I, I put myself on this isosurface, and I move with this isosurface, and take the, the substantial derivative and set it equal to zero, which means I'm staying on the surface, which then in a, in a, 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 you know, a, a, a lab-based uh, coordinate system is just here dt dt plus uh, this gradient times, and this here is just the, the propagation velocity of that isosurface. And the propagation velocity of that isosurface now you know, so this is propagation velocity of this temperature isosurface. And again, as I said, there's a formalism for how to do this from, uh, uh, I think, maybe from uh, Gibson from, from UCSD. We you know, started looking at these uh, isosurfaces. And so it turns out for a reactive isosurface, I can just write it like this. Uh, the, this surface, it depends here on the uh, diffusion uh, because diffusion makes the isosurface move, or let me just show. Um, so let's say I have, a, I have a temperature profile that looks like this, temperature as function of, you know, some x. And then now I just, um, I no velocity. OK, so I have, first of all, I have a, a background velocity. There's a u that moves this thing around. And that, that background velocity, that's here, right? But then the, the the temperature does something by itself. And um, the first thing it does is diffusion, OK? What happens if I let this temperature profile diffuse? Then it will look like this. And you see, if I, if I had looked at a, 
a, a temperature isovalue that's here, that has now moved over here. Right? So that's a diffusion, or that's a movement of the isosurface by diffusion, which is this, this first part of the term. And then the second is, if I would now say, you know, I have chemical reactions, then um, here I have chemical reactions, then uh, maybe, you know, a little later this looks like this. Or let's say I start out now with, this, with the one that has diffused, and then a little later, you know, it will, it will look like this. And then you see also here the um, isosurface has moved now by chemical reactions. You know, you, you change the field, and that can be expressed here in the second term. Okay, and then we have, of course, again, the, here the, the, iso, the normal to the iso temperature surface, which I can write like this. That's the same thing as we did before. And then I, you plug this in, and I, you know, I get, um, uh, and then I call, uh, I call the, um, the temperature at that, at that point, I call this uh, G, and then I get an equation that looks like this. And what's interesting is, is that you have this diffusion term. We can split this up, the diffusion term, into two uh, contributions. You have a diffusion term, you get um, one, so let's say I have a, a flame front here. It kind of looks like this. Right? And then this point here, we're looking at diffusion. Then I can split this up in a term that just goes in this direction, normal to the front, and a term that goes uh, tangential to the front. So these are, the, uh, these are the, the two contributions here. This is the term that goes normal to the front. That's why you have these normal vectors here. And then you have a term that goes tangential to the front, and it turns out that is then proportional to the curvature. Of the, uh, of the surface. So if there's no curvature, then, then you only have a normal diffusion, of course. You don't have a lateral diffusion. If you have curvature, you also get a lateral diffusion. Okay, and, and now, so I called, so this is a propagation from normal uh, diffusion. This is from uh, a propagation that comes here from the curvature term. And then I have also a third term here, which is the chemical source term. Now we can think, um, you know, what is flame propagation? We said earlier, flame propagation is the combination of normal diffusion and chemical source term, right? And so that's why we take the normal diffusion and the chemical source term, put them together, and say that must be the laminar flame speed, okay? So that's an assumption. That's the laminar flame speed. And then we have this lateral diffusion term here that's proportional to curvature, that term uh, remains. And so we get now two different terms. So this is the term we had earlier in the corrugated regime, uh, or you know, something like this. And then now we get an additional term here, which comes from uh, curvature effects, because the curvature now is of the same order as the flame thickness, or one over the curvature. The curvature radius, let's say, is of the order of the flame thickness. This is why we get this additional term now in that regime. And we can, we can try to see which one's more important. Okay, so you have two terms now. A, just a propagation term with a laminar flame speed and then this curvature term. And you can try to see, oh, let me just show you real quick, you know, what these mean. I mean, what's the physical meaning of this? Again, I have a, maybe a flame surface that looks like this. This is unburned and this is burnt. And then, if, uh, if you have normal propagation uh, here, maybe, in this cusp, then, you know, this will all move forward. And a little later, this looks like this. And maybe a little later, it looks like this. So the normal propagation just moves the flame ahead. And by the way, also, uh, it destroys these cusps, right? Because they will just burn out. Now, what's the, what's the curvature term? The curvature term just says, now I have a, a flame where the wrinkling, the curvature, or the curvature radius, is on the same order somehow than the flame thickness. You know? So that, uh, that's now supposed to show the flame thickness. And what happens then is just by diffusion, this whole thing here diffuses out. And then I have advanced the uh, flame just by you know, diffusion into this uh, unburned cusp region, 
Okay? So that's, that's, you know, in this regime, that's how this term here leads to flame propagation. So now here the idea is to um, uh, non-dimensionalize this with the Kolmogorov scale, assuming now that, um, that uh, you know, the wrinkling here comes from the Kolmogorov eddies. So we normalize this all with the Kolmogorov scales, and then you get an equation here that looks like this, where everything now is normalized, so everything should be order one, except you have this term here, d over nu, which of course, you know, we usually assume this to be one, roughly one, and then you have um, SL divided by uh, U. And, and this year, we don't know. I mean, that depends on the turbulence, obviously. If this is um, large or small, if it's much larger than one, much smaller than one. And it turns out this here uh, is proportional to the Karlovitz number to the minus one half. And then you see that, um, so if everything is order one, and we look at just at this term, if the Karlovitz number goes to, to zero, then this term becomes very large, okay? Karlovitz number goes to zero. This means we go into the uh, corrugated Flanwood regime, okay? And then the, the curvature should not be important, and you see that's the case here because now this term becomes very large compared to this term, okay? When the Karlovitz number goes to zero. If the Karlovitz number goes to infinity, then... Um, uh, this term here gets small, and then this, this term here will be the leading order term. And that's what we said earlier. Uh, large Karlovitz number means thin reaction zones regime. That's where this curvature term is responsible for the propagation. And small Karlovitz number means corrugated flame regime. That's when this propagation term will be more important. Okay, so we can just, um, uh, you know, leave... This keep this equation, say, this is now valid for both regimes because this term actually in the thin reaction, in the corrugate flame regime, one shouldn't have it, but we just saw it will be very small anyways. You know, it will just go away by itself. Okay, so now we have an equation and we haven't talked about, um, a, you know, any sort of averaging. Now we just have an equation and we said that equation that should be, you know, should be able to describe the local instantaneous flame propagation in both of these regimes. But at least in the thin reaction zones regime, we need to you know, think about a distribution of temperature um, around this. And so we start out um, with um, uh, a PDF again, just like we did it earlier. So if I have a you know, flame that looks like this, and let's just assume the, the mean flame front position would be like this. Then I, you know, do a, a measurement. So this is just one realization. A little later, it will look like this. A little later, it will look like this. And if I take kind of an average um, flame front position, um, uh, or if I take the PDF now of the flame front position, you see uh, there's a certain probability that there's no probability to find the flame here. Uh, there's uh, the probability of finding the flame gets larger, 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 and then there's no added probability in the burnt region. And, and that's shown here in, in this uh, experiment here by uh, Robert Cheng from, I think it's from Robert Cheng, or maybe it was done in Aachen, but this is the burner here from Robert Cheng, uh, which is called here a lean, lean swirl burner, a uh, weak swirl burner. And so they measured the flame front position and, um, you know, expressed it here in a PDF like this. This PDF is shown here. And so this means now this here is all unburned. And then this here must be all burned. And then the transition from unburned to burned is somewhere here. And so we call this then, uh, you know, this region, uh, you know, that where, you've, where you will find the flame, we call this the, uh, the turbulent flame brush. You know, this is a, a, a wider region. And then if we, from this now, we can define a mean flame front position and we can also define kind of a, a variance or root mean square or a mean uh, departure of the flame from the flame front. So that, that's the mean flame front position here. And then this here would be a root mean square um, uh, or a variance uh, and the square root of this then here LF, that, that is then the flame brush thickness. So it's kind of, you know, the width of this thing, that's what we call the flame brush thickness. 
And uh, I can express this same thing then also here in a um, G. If G is a distance function, then uh, I can say G prime, that is the departure from the mean flame front. And then, uh, so, I mean, this is the example I just showed. And of course, if I now look at the temperature, I look at the temperature, you know, just in this point here, in this one instantaneous realization, then here it would be unburned, here it would be burned. And so I get something that looks like this. But if I take the average here over all these realizations, then I get something much wider that kind of looks like this. And knowing the PDF of G and knowing the temperature as function of G, then we can just evaluate uh, the temperature uh, like this, right? Like we saw yesterday. And so these are the two quantities we need to know. Uh, for the temperature as function of G, we just take a laminar uh, flamelet, a, a laminar flame. And then for the um, uh, PDF here, we say we approximate this PDF uh, with a Gauss function. With a Gauss function, uh, which is then defined by two quantities, or basically the first two moments of, of the distribution, defined by the mean and some uh, root mean square or, or variance uh, parameter. And so we solve then equations for the mean G and for the variance, and if we have the variance and the mean, then we can, we can determine here the shape of the, uh, of the PDF. Uh, we can plug it in here and get the, uh, the temperature at any point in the field. Okay? So uh, we didn't talk about the um, derivation of these mean equations here, but, but that it's done in a similar way as we derived the other scalar equations. And um, um, you get some unclosed terms, and these unclosed terms, they're arguments for how to, uh, how to close these terms at the end of the day here. I, I mean, this shows some of the arguments uh, here for the variance equation. And um, uh, uh, there's one thing here I want to say. Um, but, um, but at the end of the day, the turbulent burning velocity comes in. And I don't want to discuss these derivations too much. Because, I mean, this was the original derivation of these equations. There has been some discussion later on, uh, and it was also acknowledged here by, these, by the author, that, um, that these equations, the G equation, has a different character than other equations. So the normal averaging techniques that we usually use, we, you can't really apply. And um, so that's why you know, people have thought about uh, using different averaging techniques um, which, which, you know, has not been introduced here uh, yet, actually, for, these, uh, for this Rand's formalism. But uh, because of this, also, we need to define this very much. Uh, need to discuss this very much. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, interesting aspects, or, I mean, the reason why can't you just do the same averaging, um, let's say I, do, I want to know the average G value at some position. Uh, you know, how do I get it? I just do a thousand experiment, measure the G value. The G value is always the distance from the flame, you know, at this point. I can easily, I mean, I have a photograph, you know, I can always, you know, easily determine this. And then I average this value. That's actually what we said here, right? Uh, here, that's what we said here. That will give me the average uh, front. But, but um, the problem is, I oh, know, see, that's why we didn't say this here. But, but if, I, if I do what I just said, the problem is we said um, the value of G is not really defined in a unique way away from the flame front. So if I derive a mean equation like this, I should only use values at the flame front and not other values, you know, because the equation is not valid for anything away from the flame front. But anyways, that's a detail. Um, that we don't need to discuss, but uh, I think the whole formalism is relatively clear. What's, what's missing then here is, uh, so in this mean equation then here again you have two terms. One is the turbulent burning velocity, the other one is um, here this curvature driven term which now has the turbulent diffusivity here. And the turbulent burning velocity, we had a model, we developed a model for this already yesterday which can be used here. So as I said, you know, I mean, people have looked at different uh, ways of defining averages. Uh, we have uh, defined 
uh, here a really nice, I think really nice, I say this really nice here, all my students' idea, uh, really nice way to uh, define the average, a really rigorous uh, way to define the average uh, in the context of LES. And uh, so this is shown here on the next few slides, but uh, maybe we don't need to discuss this. And this just shows an example then of an LES of a Bunsen flame, of a turbulent Bunsen flame. Um, this is really old. This was one of the first um, uh, LES of a turbulent premix flame. Um, so it has been a few years ago. But uh, you see here the temperature on the top. You see here this high temperature as a pilot, uh, a broad pilot that you see here. The, the gray here is kind of the flame surface. And then on the bottom here, you see the velocity. And then we can look at um, comparisons of velocity profiles or here temperature profiles and velocity profiles with uh, experiments that are shown here in, um, in the symbols. And the blue is the non-reactive and the red is the reactive. And you kind of see, uh, you know, that the agreement is not so bad. What's interesting is that for a premix flame, of course, the velocity profile, it gives us a good indication whether we predict combustion right because, uh, you know, you get the heat release and that changes the velocity profile. So the velocity profile is a good indicator. And um, yeah, here you see, this is maybe further downstream, uh, you see that this difference between non-reactive and reactive is captured really well. Um, and then this also is interesting, this is the turbulent kinetic energy. And you see that, um, I mean, it's the exact same case, only one is lit and the other one is cold. And what you see is that as soon as you light it, the turbulent kinetic energy goes down very, very strongly. Uh, and that is because, um, first of all, of the heat release, the heat release itself makes, I mean, without the temperature effect, makes the, uh, uh, damps the turbulence. And then secondly, the um, high temperature then also changes viscosity and also makes the temperature smaller. But you see there's a huge difference here in the kinetic energy. This is interesting, as part of this study, we then also developed a new regime diagram. And the regime diagram here was then specifically for LES. And in LES, um, you have, um, I mean, um, you have um, model parameters also, which are uh, very important. So in LES, you have to choose the filter size. Uh, we said this yesterday. You can choose a really large filter size, and you can choose a really small filter size. What's interesting is uh, that's a model parameter, right? It shouldn't change the physics of, of the case you're considering. The physics are the physics. They should not be changed by the way you compute it. And if we look at the regime by this Borgi peters diagram, it has U prime on one axis and it has um, uh, LT on the other axis, which now would be the subfilter quantities. But of course, the subfilter kinetic energy the kinetic energy you have only on a subfilter scale, it changes by changing the filter. And so here, the diagram is constructed so that you have um, the numerical parameter on this axis, and this axis here is only physics, okay? And so, as I said, U prime over SL changes if you change the, the filter, and also LT over LF changes. But what the, really describes the physics is the Karlowitz number, okay? So that's why we use the Karlowitz number here as this axis, and now this axis only describes the physics, and the other axis only describes the numerics, okay? So, um, so now, and actually, by the way, that would have been a much better way to draw the original diagram, the original, you know, Borgi diagram, or I think, I think Foreman Williams had a similar one uh, earlier, I think actually he had one where he um, used the Karlowitz number. The Karlowitz number is the real parameter, okay? It's not U prime over SL. It's not LT over LF. And that's why in that diagram you get kind of a weird, you know, one-third uh, power that describes this line. Why, why did they use U prime over SL and LT over LF? Because these are quantities experimentalists understand really well. You know, the Karlowitz number... Uh, maybe not so much, but but these other, I mean, people who work with engines, you know, uh, Rogan applications, they understand these really well. But really, this is the right parameter to use. And then you see the regimes now, you know, they are really, I mean, one is left and one's in the middle and one is right. 
And then, um, you know, here in the bottom, then, we have, you know, kind of resolved turbulence, but unresolved combustion is this regime here. Then we have a DNS regime where everything is resolved. And, um, yeah, and so on. And um, uh, now the Dumb-Köhler number, Dumb-Köhler equal to one line, also has relevance because um, in, in this region here, you know, for larger Dumb-Köhler number, the, all the flame thickness, you know, that's broadened by the turbulence is still on the subfilter scale. So, so the, the temperature, even though the flame is broadened by the turbulence, it jumps still from one cell to the next, from zero to one. And in this, in this regime here, the, um, the flame becomes thicker than the, than the filter size. And so you get a distribution also on the, on the resolved scale in LES. So we evaluated then these parameters here in this simulation I just showed you here in the simulation. I just showed you in each single point on the flame surface and put each single point in this regime diagram. And then you see what's interesting is that um, when we say a flame is nominally at this point, you know, that's if you read a paper, you will very often see this diagram shown and, and the simulation or the experiment is one point in the diagram. But really, of course, um, you know, there's a distribution of Karlovitz numbers because, you know, the turbulence fluctuates locally. You get high values, low values. And you see here, this goes all the way here, let's say, from corrugated flamelets to, yeah, all the close to the broken reaction zones regime. But definitely, it goes here in these two different uh, regimes where the flame is on the subfilter scale, entirely on subfilter scale, to partially resolved. So that's... that's um, that's interesting, of course, when you do modeling. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so then, um, then let's uh, look at um, uh, non-premixed combustion real quick. Non-premixed combustion, with everything we have, is now is very easy now. I mean, there's not much to do. Uh, let me just remind you again, we had introduced the mixer fraction as a, a quantity that is not produced or consumed. So it has a, a conserved scalar transport equation, no chemical source term. And the mixer fraction tells us if a mixer is locally lean or rich, mixer fraction zero is pure air, um, a pure, uh, a mixer fraction one is pure fuel. And so uh, we know, I mean, we, if you know the mixer fraction field, you know our stoichiometric is here, and this is where the flame will burn. And you know this is where the temperature will be high and so on. So um, the other thing we discussed yesterday is, let's say now I know the PDF of the mixer fraction, and let's say now I know the temperature as function of mixer fraction, then you know, I can easily determine the mean quantities. You know, in every point in the field, if you know the PDF, and you know the temperature function of mixer fraction, then you can determine all mean quantities, all mass fractions, mixer fractions, uh, mass fraction and temperature and so on. So what we need, all we need to do here is to find the model for f of z and the model for t of z, and then we're done, right? So that's what we will do. Um, we will start out here by the model for the PDF of mixer fraction. That's not so difficult, actually, because, again, you know, it's a conserved scalar. Um, we have an equation for the mean. We can solve this, and we have, an, we have to find an equation for the variance of mixer fraction. Uh, you know, we had introduced models here for all of this, and so we can solve this also. This means, you know, in, without knowing much about the chemistry, I can solve an equation for the mean, mix, uh, mean and variance of mixer fraction. And in each computational cell, let's say if you do a simulation, you know these two values. Okay? So now, uh, just like we did before, now I can just assume um, the mixer fraction follows a Gauss distribution. Okay? And the Gauss distribution, you know, I know the full PDF just knowing the mean and the variance. Right? So that's it. So we assume a Gauss distribution. Should we assume a Gauss distribution or not? We said in nature, Gauss distribution, you know, is often encountered um, a normal distribution. Should we use a normal distribution for mixer fraction? No, why not? Yeah, 
because, um, because um, the mixture fraction defi was defined between zero and one. It, it cannot be larger than one, it cannot be less than zero. Um, so, uh, but, a, but a normal distribution has non-zero probability you know, all the way to infinity and minus infinity. Okay, so people have at some point thought, okay, that doesn't work, we use a clipped Gaussian. So what you do, you take a Gaussian, and then you, you, you know, set the values a larger one and smaller zero, uh, you set these to zero, and then now you, you, sub, you took away a little probability, and you scale the rest, you know, so that the integral is one again. So that's one way to do it. Um, this is not very good. I mean, you could, there, there, there are uh, quantities which are bounded only on one side. So for example, dissipation rate, it cannot be negative, but it can go all the way to infinity, okay? So that for these, um, typically, we use a, what's called a log normal distribution, okay? So that that's sh just means if you take the log, then it's a normal distribution uh, of that function because the log of something goes between zero and infinity, goes between minus infinity and plus infinity, right? And for the mix, for a quantity that is bounded between two values, um, the appropriate function is what's called a beta function. And the beta function is just like, um, actually for, you know, for, for small variance, it becomes a normal distribution. Uh, but for larger variants, it goes to, I mean, uh, it, it's still defined between 0 and 1. And if the variance becomes very large, what's the largest variance you can have? You know, if, if I have, a, if I have a, a quantity that goes between 0 and 1, what's the largest variance I can have? Or, or what does the, what's the physical scenario that gives me the largest variance? The scenario that gives me the largest variance, if I in one cell or whatever in the field I'm looking at, fuel and oxygen, they're, they're totally separated, right? There has been no mixing yet. And what PDF would that correspond to? Okay, all, I have only two possible values. Zero and one. Yeah, that's a double delta function like we had before. Okay, so that that's the nice. So in a in a turbulent jet, okay, just downstream of the nozzle in the mid in the vicinity of the shear layer, you know, mixing you know has almost not taken place. If you measure the the um, composition there, you are you will you depending on you know how this thing wobbles back and forth you will either measure pure fuel or pure air, right? That is the, the largest variance that is possible, and, um, uh, and that's a double delta function. And so that's nice about this thing. When you go to the largest possible variance, you get a double delta function. You see this, uh, I mean, it's almost a delta function here, almost a delta function here, and then very little uh, probability of finding something in between. What is the largest variance you can have is z times one, one minus z. That's the largest possible variance. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, uh, right. And you see here, you know, for smaller variance, you get something that looks like a Gauss distribution. And actually, even smaller variance, this becomes more like a Gauss distribution, even smaller variance at some point, it becomes a delta function, you know, here at the mean value. And, and for very large variance, you know, it's, it's um, double delta function. So it describes, you know, this behavior really well. So that's what we're going to use is the, is the beta uh, function. And people have looked at this, you know, they've compared it with DNS data, and usually it's really good. Okay, so, so we have the PDF, and now we need to know the temperature as function of mixer fraction, right? And, and the mass fraction as function of mixer fraction. And we had a few models for this already. We said uh, Booker Schumann model. That gives me the temperature as a function of mixer fraction, uh, as an analytical description. Or, for example, so that's infinitely fast, irreversible chemistry. Or I could say I have, in, ir, if I have um, infinitely fast, reversible chemistry. We call this chemical equilibrium, right? And so, if you have equilibrium, also, I can determine, uh, you know, the, the temperature and the mass fraction as a function of 
the composition, the mixer fraction, right? So that's, that's why, I mean, here this shows again, Book Schumann solution gives you temperature function mixer fraction. And by the way, that is the easiest um, uh, combustion model for non-premise combustion that you can use. If you're just interested in the heat release, roughly, uh, you know, this is a very easy model to use. You just use the beta function and, um, and the temperature here from this, and then the mean temperature, the mean density can all be computed. Okay, and then the second one we want to use the flamelet model. And now, according to my watch here, it's exactly three o'clock, okay? So I want you guys now to have a nice uh, break, but exactly at 3.15, I want everyone be seated here again, okay? <laughs> I will start at uh, 3.15 sharp. <laughs>